the Sustainable Energy Management Master's program, you are answering one simple question. Do you care about your future generation? You know, if you care about your kids, their kids, their grandkids, then you care about sustainability. And a sustainability manager is someone who has the tools to make people understand how they can contribute towards developing a sustainable world. We have both part-time and full-time students. Our curriculum is 30 hours. Instead of thesis, we have a research project course and a seminar course which provides them with the kind of research background they will need to be successful in their job. At the same time, sustainability is not always everything about environment. It also relates to the business. They will take a sustainable business strategies course. They will take a project management course. Most of these courses are going to be taught by industry people, the people who are doing sustainability on a daily basis as a part of their job. Any organization that has a large number of employees and has a physical infrastructure, they will have to have a sustainability office. If you have the passion to develop and maintain a sustainable world, come to us and we will help you shape your passion into a career which will create an impact. The Stevens Institute of Technology is proud to present the Hugo New Corporation Sustainability Seminar Series, co-sponsored by Geocentric Consultants, H2M Architect Engineers, Brown and & Codwell, and BEM Systems. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, and, and thanks, Samir, for helping with preparations for this webinar. Um, I regret, of course, that I'm not able to join you in person, uh, but virtual is the best we have at this point in time. Uh, hopefully, we'll get another bite at the apple. I much would, I, I would uh, much rather do this in person, but we'll use the technological tools available to us uh, to try to really facilitate a dialogue. Um, just a quick note, Samir is going to help me with uh, advancing the slides for reasons that I won't get into. I'm not able to actually get into the Zoom uh, webinar right now, so please uh, bear with us if we uh, have some coordination issues. Um, so with that, Samir, if you wouldn't mind advancing the slide to slide number two, which is Port Authority Facilities. Uh, I suspect that many of you are probably familiar with the agency and familiar with our assets. Um, but given that this is what we own, operate, and must protect, uh, it's useful to start off with kind of a grounding of uh, what the agency is and what assets uh, we control, manage, and in some cases operate. Um, so the Port Authority is a bi-state authority. Uh, it comprises uh, really the five boroughs of New York City uh, and the uh, sort of urban industrialized areas of northern New Jersey. Uh, it was just a bit of history for you. It was the country's first by state authority constituted in 1921 uh, by an act of Congress. Uh, actually, the agency has its 99th uh, anniversary coming up at the end of the month. I think that will be a fairly subdued celebration, but hopefully we'll be back strong for year 100 next year. Um, as Professor mentioned, uh, we have a $37 billion capital plan, 10-year capital plan. Um, that actually leverages a significant additional amount of private capital so that the total amount of spending um, will be more like $50 billion. Um, so we have uh, triple P's uh, and tenant-led projects that leverage Port Authority capital investments to kind of amplify the very substantial resources we're able to put into the capital plan ourselves. Um, Port Authority operates, uh, owns and operates uh, aviation facilities. So we have the uh, three major commercial aviation facilities, JFK, LaGuardia, uh, and Newark Liberty International Airport, uh, as well as a smaller commercial airport, a former military base in upstate New York called Stewart International, uh, and Teterboro Airport, which is a general aviation and executive airport. Um, between those facilities, last year we implaned over 140 million passengers which would make us the largest aviation authority by employments in the world. Uh, that obviously will dip given the current situation, but still a very high magnitude of uh, passengers and cargo going through those facilities uh, and a very substantial capital plan to support it. Uh, in no particular order, um, we have a tunnels, bridges, and terminals group as well. Uh, so this includes most notably George Washington Bridge. Uh, 
which is the country's uh, most uh, largest bridge, I guess, by passenger volume and by truck volume. Uh, it used to be the world's largest, but I'm sure it's been overtaken by probably several bridges in China at this point. But a very, very substantial volume generating over $600 million a year in toll revenue and helping to cross-subsidize some of our other operations. In addition, uh, we own and operate Bayonne Bridge, Gothels Bridge, and Outer Bridge Crossing on Staten Island uh, across to Union County uh, and Essex County. Uh, there's Port Authority Bus Terminal, which is the busiest uh, bus terminal in the world, uh, George Washington Bridge Bus Terminal, and uh, Journal Square Transportation Center. Um, we also own and operate uh, the Holland Tunnel and the Lincoln Tunnel as well. Uh, Holland Tunnel, uh, in the context of an engineering class, is very interesting because it was the first uh, mechanical, mechanically ventilated vehicular tunnel in the world. Uh, we have the PATH system, Port Authority Trans-Hudson. Probably many of you are very familiar with this. Um, it connects destinations in Lower Manhattan and Midtown uh, with Hoboken, Jersey City, and Newark. Uh, and although it's a small line by, um, by, it's a small system by linear track miles, uh, it's very large in terms of volume, over 80 million passengers last year. Um, that would put us somewhere between the MARTA system in uh, Atlanta. We're larger than that uh, and slightly smaller than the SEPTA system in Philadelphia. So although it's dwarfed by New York City Transit, it's still a major uh, urban rail operation. Um, and, of course, you can't have a port authority without ports. Uh, so the, uh, the port complex of New York and New Jersey is the second largest in the entire country and certainly the largest on the East Coast. Uh, only Los Angeles is larger. Uh, this comprises major uh, uh, terminals, especially containerized freight, bulk, uh, brake bulk, liquid bulk, uh, and automobiles in northern New Jersey, and a few smaller facilities uh, in Staten Island and Brooklyn. And then, of course, there's a real estate portfolio. So that comprises the World Trade Center, of course, the 16-acre campus. Um, and it also includes some other real estate holdings uh, scattered throughout the region. So that's the Port Authority in a nutshell. It's big. It has a big capital plan. has a very important role in uh, local, regional, national transportation. Um, next slide, please. So this is slide three. And if you wouldn't mind ad advancing, the first word that comes up here, perhaps this is my clumsy attempt to represent this big, ugly word, risk. Uh, something each agency or organization, public and private, uh, has to deal with. And if you'd advance the slide again, so physical should pop up. And you can see that from an engineering standpoint, of course, and this is my primary orientation, um, most of what we, most of our orientation to the problem of risk mitigation is through physical interventions, engineering solutions. Uh, and I don't want to get too much into codifying or defining, but I've uh, kind of thrown up four buckets of physical risk mitigation measures for your consideration. Uh, we have Harden, uh, which is really to make the facility more robust in the context of uh, coastal flood mitigation. And I should say, uh, although I'm not going to toggle backward, when you look at the port district, you can see that a lot of our facilities are right on the water or coastally adjacent, whether or not they're water dependent. So coastal, uh, coastal storm surge and sea level rise uh, is one of the biggest challenges, biggest natural hazard risks facing our facilities today. Um, one of the ways that you might mitigate that is to harden the facility, to dry flood proof it, to build flood walls, whether those are permanent, deployable, or temporary. Um, if you had the option and it was operationally feasible, you might elevate a facility. So let's say we had a substation and it was feasible to elevate the very sensitive equipment, the transformers and switch gear above the flood hazard area, um, that would be a good strategy as well. Uh, one that probably doesn't get as much uh, notice, but should. Um, it's applicable in more limited circumstances, but nonetheless a useful tool in the toolbox is accommodating the hazard. I'm um, thinking specifically of wet flood proofing here. It's only available for certain types of assets, uh, those uh, that are not occupiable, that are used for storage, or parking, for example. But this would be employing engineered flood vents to let in flood waters so that the, uh, 
the floodwaters hydrostatically equalize on either side of the wall. Once the flood event has passed, it drains out, you clean up the space. The materials are meant to withstand brackish water for a certain period of time, you're back in business. Um, and then, of course, there's relocate. Obviously, we don't really have that option for many of our facilities. Um, we're not going to get another 5,000 acres for JFK Airport, uh, for example, uh, or for any of our facilities. Um, so for other regions, this might be feasible to actually relocate assets away from the hazard. For us, we try to work within our facilities, within our facility footprints to uh, first to basically site our critical infrastructure in a smart and strategic way. Uh, so going back to the example of a substation, this might be just removing it from a very severe flood hazard area to a less severe flood hazard area, or if we're blessed with a space that's high and dry and it can accommodate uh, this infrastructure, uh, moving it there where it won't be uh, at immediate risk and doesn't require any of the sort of engineered solutions that I mentioned previously. Um, but you can see that although the big ugly word risk has been minimized uh, and that we have in scare quotes bought down risk through um, physical flood mitigation measures or uh, physical flood hazard or hazard mitigation measures, there is still residual risk. Um, it's rarely possible to mitigate or manage all of the risk that we face solely through physical measures, sometimes because it's not operationally feasible oftentimes because it's not financially feasible. Uh, there's always a cost benefit when we're coming up with a physical risk mitigation strategy. Uh, and this is really uh, where the nexus comes in, uh, per the title of this presentation, the nexus of physical and financial measures. Mir, if you wouldn't mind advancing the slide. So we should see a circle that comes up and says financial, and you can see the, uh, the risk uh, is further mitigated, is further bought down. So what do we do with the remainder or the residual risk after we have mitigated through physical measures? We turn to our partners uh, in the financial sector to try to further mitigate that risk. Uh, once again, I'm not uh, really going to, I'm not interested in establishing definitions or codifying here, but the basic mechanisms of financial risk transfer are um, our, our insurance. So this is something that I think everyone's familiar with in some fashion or another, whether it's uh, renter's insurance, um, whether it's health insurance, it is basically a pooled resource where you pay an entity to effectively assume a certain amount of financial risk for you. Uh, that's insurance. There is, for certain agencies or entities, uh, there might be the option of reducing your exposure. So this might be divesting yourselves of portions of the business um, that are at very high risk. In our case, of course, we're not going to do that, but private sector firm might say this business line or this facility or this operation uh, might be at, we, we might assume too much risk here um, based on our financial positions. Uh, we can not spend any more money to physically mitigate this risk. We are going to sell off a certain portion of the business or dilute uh, our ownership stake. Uh, you can share risk. So you can bring on uh, public or private partners to help you share the risk burden. Uh, and we certainly do this through the mechanism of public-private partnerships uh, and, uh, and tenant arrangements as well. Many of our facilities are landlord facilities, our ports in particular, uh, many of our aviation facilities. The risk is shared really between us and our private partners in this case. Uh, and then, of course, there's the decision to financially retain your risk. You still need to understand it, uh, to characterize it, to quantify it where you can. But in some cases, it makes sense for you to keep a certain small amount of residual risk uh, in your portfolio and to plan for it. So the Port Authority, for example, I won't get into details here, we retain a certain amount of risk by self-insuring. And we even have something called a captive insurer, which is basically an entity or subsidiary of the Port Authority that we, uh, we're we basically the sole client of, we pay into, uh, and it has a certain, um, base, our insurance coverage is structured so that the captive insurer will pay out under certain events. What I think hasn't been explored particularly well, uh, at least in our industry, 
uh, and I would venture to say in the financial financial industry as well, is how to bridge these um, risk mitigation techniques effectively in order to come up with a more holistic, comprehensive package of risk mitigation uh, in a cost-effective way. So the really the crux of this presentation is to look at the potential synergies and complementarity between physical risk mitigation and financial risk mitigation. And I'm going to draw on some experiences that I have uh, working with our internal treasury group, including our financial risk managers, to place uh, property risk insurance coverage over the last four or five years or so. Uh, so, Samir, next slide, please. This is slide number four. Uh, and this slide is entitled Climate Resilience Design Guidelines. So this is taking a step back and uh, letting you know what we do on the physical risk mitigation side uh, and um, how our processes are governed. Um, this, these guidelines are technical guidelines, but they're rooted in a policy platform. This is very important for any agency that's thinking about uh, adopting guidelines for climate resilience or natural hazard mitigation. There needs to be a strong uh, policy underpinning. And in our case, we've had an environmental policy, environmental sustainability policy since 1993. But very significantly, in 2008, we amended the policy. When I say we, I mean the Port Authority's Board of Commissioners uh, to develop, and I'll just read this because the, the verbiage is important, develop strategies that reduce the risk posed by climate change to our facilities and operations and in collaboration with other regional stakeholders, develop strategies that mitigate the risk to the region posed by climate change in a manner in a manner that will promote a sustainable environment. So that was the policy directive from our Board of Commissioners in 2008. And the engineering department responded to that policy mandate in 2009 by issuing a design memorandum. Um, the individual who is responsible for all design operations, internal or external at the Port Authority, is called the Chief of Design, reporting directly to the Chief Engineer. And in 2009, this individual uh, issued an advisory memo to all design teams, once again, internal and external, saying, thou shalt consider a changing climate in the way you design your projects. It was fairly light on guidance. It included some early uh, climate projections from New York City Panel on Climate Change, um, but it left it to design teams really to figure out how to integrate this information into the design process. But this was really a bridge to the development of more robust and more holistic climate resilience design guidelines. This was prior to my time at the agency, but I understand originally they were due to uh, come out in 2012, late 2012 or early 2013. Obviously, Hurricane Sandy happened and uh, all staff who were working on these guidelines or just about anything else shifted, first of all, into response mode and then recovery mode. And it was not, therefore, until January of 2015 that we were able to circle back around and supersede the design memorandum with the first iteration of the climate resilience design guidelines. Uh, these guidelines were updated under my uh, management in 2018, in June 2018. Uh, this is what we call a half-step update. It really maintained the technical basis uh, of the first guidelines, of the first iteration of the guidelines. It just broadened uh, and clarified the application criteria. Um, and I should say that uh, if you just Google Climate Resilience and Port Authority or PANYNJ, uh, these design guidelines will will come up in your um, in your search engine. Uh, next slide, please. So this is slide number five. Just to give you a sense of what the objectives of the design guidelines are, and like I said, these have correspondence directly with the uh, policy. Uh, they're to maximize long-term safety, service, and resilience of our assets now and in the future. And I emphasize and in the future as climate conditions change. So understanding that climate stationarity is uh, not realistic, we are trying to look at uh, projected climate conditions over the full expected service life of the assets that we're designing and delivering today. Uh, it provides a science-based approach to managing climate-related risks. Um, the sea level rise projections and, and, and actually all climate stressor predictions that we leverage in the guidelines come from New York City Panel on Climate Change. 
uh, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, um, and some of them are actually embedded in New York state law and may at some point in the near future be embedded in New Jersey state law. Uh, unlike the original design memorandum, uh, these guidelines are intended to provide a very clear methodology uh, and, quite frankly, a simplistic methodology for factoring in sea level rise. Um, so it's meant to be easily accessible and digestible by design teams uh, to try to take some of the mystery out of the uh, how to factor in future climate conditions in developing a basis of design and design criteria. Um, this is a very important point. Uh, it provides flexibility for design teams to develop cost-effective design solutions. So what it does not do is pre prescribe those solutions. It helps design teams establish criteria using a certain amount of professional judgment and discretion, but it does not force a particular solution, dry flood proofing, wet flood proofing, elevation, relocation, et cetera. Um, understanding that design teams have a variety of different objectives they need to meet, that there are a variety of different operational, let's say, opportunities and constraints. So uh, we have a member of our staff who embed with the design team to help I guess, facilitate that dialogue so that the design team does come up with a design solution, kind of a, a, a cost-effective, sensible, strategic design solution uh, during alternatives analysis, but the guidelines themselves do not impose a solution. I think that's very important. Uh, and the guidelines address the hazards, the sort of more, most likely hazards uh, for our port district. Um, like I said earlier, Obviously, most of our facilities are coastal and coastally adjacent. Um, we have uh, Hurricane Sandy in our rearview mirror, um, only eight years away from that. So sea level rise and storm surge have been the focus of the guidelines to date. Um, there is some treatment of extreme heat and extreme precipitation. There may be other stressors in the future. Um, but really, the intention is to incorporate a multi-stressor approach in the next iteration of the guidelines, our work plan has that um, scheduled, well, originally scheduled for the end of this year. We're probably looking at uh, mid-2021, given some adjustments um, based on the, the current coronavirus issues. Um, so, Samir, if you would advance to the next slide. This is slide number six. Uh, and if you uh, click to advance one, you should see uh, sort of a yellow uh, highlight uh, on the leftmost column, which is FEMA-based flood elevation. This is just, as I said, the intentionally simplistic guidance for design teams to help them develop what we call the sea level rise DFB or SLR uh, design flood elevation. Um, so the formula is you take the FEMA-based flood elevation at your site. So the question that the design team asks itself and like I said, there's a member of my staff who's embedded with the team to help facilitate this conversation. Is the project in or proximate to a current or projected future FEMA floodplain? Uh, and if the answer is no, then the climate resilience guidelines are not applicable. The design team or the client team can choose to adopt them uh, or they can choose to explore them under different stressor scenarios like extreme heat or extreme precipitation but they are not mandatory if there is no foreseeable hazard. I think that kind of makes sense. Um, but if there is a foreseeable hazard, the design team is directed to reference the nearest plausible base flood elevation. Um, the base flood elevation is the elevation of the effectively the 1% annual exceedance probability flood, better known as the 100-year flood. So if that, and that's reference to the North American vertical datum of 1988, which is approximately mean sea level. So if the design team sees that the project is sited in, let's say, today's 500-year floodplain, um, what they would do is they would effectively trace over to the nearest uh, hydraulically and hydrologically connected base flood elevation and adopt that. Uh, the next step, uh, Samir, if you would advance, and now you should see a blue square around asset service life, is the addition of a sea level rise adjustment factor, which is calibrated to the expected service life of the asset. So the design team says, asks itself, um, and we include, of course, the client team, which is really the line department project management team in this conversation. 
how long do we need this uh, asset to last, last uh, realistically? How long is it designed to last? And maybe even more realistically, how long do we expect it might need to serve? Uh, obviously, we're um, our wor- world is uh, littered with infrastructure right now that has served um, many, many years behind, uh, beyond its original design life. We want to make sure that we account for that in our thinking. Uh, if the design life is uh, intended to terminate prior to 2050, then per the New York City Panel on Climate Change mid-range scenario, and as I mentioned, this is also actually encapsulated in New York state law. This is part 490, if you want to Google that. We would add 16 inches of sea level rise. This is effectively the median model. Um, For assets that we would expect to last from 2051 to 2080, we would add 28 inches of sea level rise. Uh, For assets that we expect to last 2081 or beyond, we would add 36 inches of sea level rise. Um, there are certainly projections that are higher. There are projections that are lower. Um, we've shot for the middle here. There is an opportunity for design teams and project management teams uh, to further refine this, especially for projects that um, are of great magnitude and have additional technical resources. There is sort of an alternative compliance pathway that allows you to model um, a base flood elevation that includes various sea level rise scenarios. But for most projects, um, the team doesn't have time or resources to do that. So once again, the intentionally simplistic arithmetic approach of taking FEMA-based flood elevation and adjusting it for future sea, projected future sea level rise. Um, then what we do is we add freeboard. So freeboard, uh, which is a factor of safety or a buffer above and beyond the base flood elevation plus sea level rise. Uh, is encapsulated in ASC 24, uh, flood resistant design and construction. Um, that's included in New York, in New Jersey building code and adapted um, for New York City building code Appendix G, which carries the same title. Uh, and it really says we'll, we'll build an additional margin of safety above and beyond what we think the base flood elevation is, just to be conservative in our design. And the amount of freeboard that you add is. Uh, is based on the criticality of the asset. Um, In ASC 24, this is the design flood class, uh, ranging from one to four. Four would be a very critical facility, um, let's say like a hospital, um, a police station, that sort of thing. Uh, Design flood flood class three would be, um, let's say, an area of public assembly or a school Um, Design flood class two might be a retail space uh, or a residence. Um, So we ask ourselves, is the asset uh, classified as critical? And I should say, too, that um, although building code only applies to buildings, of course, um, we have added critical infrastructure types uh, into the guidelines directly. So this includes things like fire suppression systems, uh, like substations, like um, rail or automobile tunnels, vent buildings, um, the types of assets that we need to be operational uh, in order to uh, maintain business continuity at our facilities. So for assets that are not classified as critical, we add 12 inches of freeboard. Um, for assets that are classified as critical, we add 24 inches of freeboard, uh, and that's for ASE 24. There are a couple of scenarios in New York City building code uh, in zones of significant wave action, also called B zones, um, where we would be required to add 36 inches of freeboard. Um, those situations don't arise very frequently, so I won't go into that too much. Uh, so, Samir, if you'd advance to slide seven, please. So, this is just a, a simple set of tables um, that indicate the, the, the final uh, SLR DFEs that we arrive at using this formula. Uh, So for non-critical assets, as you can see, we have um, the FEMA-based flood elevation, which is site-specific, of course, plus 28 inches, all the way to uh, plus 48 inches for assets that we expect to last uh, toward the end of the century and beyond. For critical assets, we would add between 40 and 60 inches, actually more properly 72 inches if we had 36 inches of freeboard, uh, depending on the uh, expected a useful life of that asset. Um, so slide eight. 
So this is an actual Port Authority project. Um, the pre previous explanation was probably a bit of abstract, so this um, tries to kind of break it down and make it a little bit more concrete for you so you can relate to it. Um, this is an actual Sandy recovery project funded in part by the Federal Transit Administration. Pardon me, just grabbing a drink of water. Um, so you can see the SLR DFE at the top there, top left, the FEMA base flood elevation at this site. And I should say, you know, given this audience, you are probably very familiar familiar with this head house. Uh, it sits in Jersey City. Uh, it is probably literally 10 feet from the pier line uh, next to the Hudson River. It is in a coastal zone A, which is a zone of moderate wave action, and it's immediately adjacent uh, to a, a zone of significant wave action, what's called a zone V. Uh, it's also very critical because it's where two uh, important path lines, the one to Newark and the one to Hoboken, tie up, uh, and where, true to the name of Exchange Place, it's where you would transfer from one line to the other. Um, this facility was flooded during Sandy, and obviously we think it's very critical uh, to the operation of, uh, of PATH in general. Without this station, really, um, there's, there can be very, very limited functionality. And uh, what's more, it provides a potential pathway for uh, floodwater infiltration to the tubes themselves, which is an even bigger problem. So protecting this to a high standard was very important to us. So the way we established the design flood elevation, once again, FEMA-based flood elevation, that's at 12 feet. Um, and that's just reference from the FEMA preliminary flood insurance rate map. Um, at that facility, it is, it is in a current FEMA special flood hazard area, which is uh, more popularly known as the 100-year floodplain. Um, as a facility of public accommodation or public assembly, we added two feet of freeboard. So this is all code, but above and beyond code, we added our sea level rise adjustment per the Port Authority guidelines of three feet. We expect this asset um, to last past 2080, hopefully beyond the end of the century. This resulted in a design flood elevation of 17 feet, um, NAVD 88, which is approximately seven feet above the grade. So how did our design team respond? And once again, this is sort of in the category of physical risk mitigation. The design solutions that the team came up with uh, leveraging some of our guidance were to construct a flood wall on the water side. This is what I like to call a good old concrete wall. Nothing particularly interesting or innovative about it, but when done right, very effective at keeping water out and withstanding flood loads. Uh, and in our case, probably one of the more innovative aspects of this project was um, as I mentioned, it's currently in a coastal zone A. It's immediately adjacent to a coastal zone V, a zone of significant wave action where you would have breaking wave loads to contend with. The original solution actually would have been an aquarium glass wall, which would not have withstood the breaking wave loads. What we charged our consultant team to do was perform some very basic modeling to look at the potential migration of the zone of significant wave action. And they determined that probably sometime between 2040 and 2060, the headhouse itself would be in a coastal V zone. So we made the decision to scrap the aquarium glass wall and go with a solution that would actually withstand those breaking wave loads. There is, for architectural considerations at the seven foot level, a Clara story to let light in. Um, but it's a design solution that we wouldn't have come to unless we had leveraged the guidelines. Um, on the other side, which faces inland, um, you can see that's where the numbers are arrayed, one, two, three, and four. Um, item number four is an aquarium glass wall, a curved aquarium glass wall. This side wouldn't be realistically subjected to breaking wave loads. Um, so that's about a, a four-inch aquarium glass wall. Uh, the items number three, um, which stretch across to one to two on either side, these are what we call side coiling flexible fabric barriers. These are really, um, really hot, heavy duty membranes like Zodiac raft material uh, grafted to uh, woven Kevlar, really a bulletproof vest. Uh, and they sit in stainless steel cabinets on either side 
um, of the escalators in front of the uh, critical um, fare box equipment and turnstiles. And they can be with just uh, basically one operations personnel uh, removed from the box. They slide across almost like a shower curtain on a stainless steel wire. Um, they're secured into place on three sides, the floor and each uh, lateral aspect. And they're as strong as steel, really. So that's uh, that's the deployable solution we have for this as uh, asset, given that uh, in normal operations, 99.9% .9 of the time, people need uh, ingress and egress in that space. Um, then really to accommodate the, the personnel that would deploy the um, flexible fabric barriers, we added flood rated doors at the exits. And then we added some structural reinforcement, actually using some fairly innovative uh, structural fabrics uh, for the existing uh, vent shaft and stair shaft walls. So that's what the design team came up with. This project, if you've been uh, to Exchange Place Headhouse recently, is in the early stages of construction. Uh, so next slide. And this is really where I pivot back now that I've hopefully provided a good overview and a, an illustrative example of what we do on the engineering side for Port Authority guidelines and policy. This is pivoting back to the nexus between physical risk mitigation and financial, financial risk mitigation. And these are slides that uh, when I team up with our treasurer and CFO and financial risk manager um, every year, we, we do, I, I guess, what I would term a dog and pony show to the property risk underwriters. We really get all the folks who are in the market together in a room, uh, and we talk to them about our program and try to give them a sense of confidence as to what we've done on the physical risk mitigation side in preparation to uh, make sure that they're more informed when they offer when they submit their policy offerings to us. So these are slides that were actually used in last year's. Uh, this was last. This was May of 2019. This was used in last year's. Uh, presentation to about 40 property risk insurance underwriters. And the point here is that the Port Authority, as a public agency and steward of really important regional and national and international transportation assets, um, looks at our assets and looks at the risk to those assets from natural hazards in a cumulative sense. So what I did here was I built a tool uh, with the help of my staff and some consultant resources really using all publicly available uh, and reputable tools and calculators. Um, and it looks at the cumulative failure risk of our assets, of a given asset, over the lifespan of that asset, given various sea level rise scenarios. And the user can customize these, but I loaded in the uh, five U.S. Army Corps uh, sea level change calculator scenarios everywhere, everything from NOAA low to NOAA high. Um, and I included, although it's not realistic, uh, a no sea level rise scenario as well, just for the purposes of comparison. And what you see here uh, is if you are just to design to the base flood elevation, once again, I'm using exchange place sort of as an illustrative example here. Um, if we were to design just to base flood elevation of 12 feet, we would expect even with no sea level rise for there to be an approximately 55% chance of failure. When I say failure, I mean failure is really um, a proxy term. What I mean is an exceedance event, an event that would exceed the design flood elevation. Uh, we could anticipate that there was a 55% chance of that happening even with no sea level rise. And obviously, uh, that would buy into the fiction that there is climate stationarity. Under even the historic rate of sea level rise, and that's approximately a foot um, per century, and this is you know well recorded at the battery. We have records of um, sea level change at the battery going back to the 1870s or 1880s. Um, we we have a about a 65 percent chance cumulative um, probability of failure over the lifespan of the asset. Getting into perhaps the more scientifically credible um, and even more conservative sea level change scenarios, going to NOAA intermediate high all the way to NOAA high. NOAA high would yield about six feet of sea level rise by 2100. Um, we have a 94 to virtually 100% chance of 
uh, at least one failure event over an 80 year period of time, which is pretty unacceptable from um, from the standpoint of a public agency uh, or I would imagine most uh, public or private owners. So Samir, if you would advance the slide, uh, you should see sort of the bar charts fade down. This would be designing to building code. And obviously the purpose of building code really fundamentally is rooted in life safety. And this shows that code does in fact buy down risk to a degree. Uh, so with no sea level rise, we would have about a 28% a probability of failure um, with historic rate of sea level rise, 33 to 34% chance of failure over 80 years. Um, going to no intermediate high, um, 62, all the way up to about 92% with the NOAA high scenario. So I would argue, particularly in the latter three, in the, in the rightmost three sea level change scenarios, um, still too great a probability of failure over the expected asset lifespan. And if you would advance one more, you should see DFE 17 feet to the upper right-hand corner. Uh, this is applying the Port Authority's guidelines, so code plus an additional three feet of sea level rise. And you see that it buys down risk very significantly. So under a no sea level change scenario, 8% uh, probability of failure over 80 years. Um, getting once again to the more scientifically credible scenarios, anywhere between, let's say, 20 and 40% chance of failure. Um, you could certainly make the argument that 40% chance of failure may be too high, um, but that's an argument that that at least is a, a conversation to have uh, between engineering, um, project management, and our external stakeholders. Uh, so if you advance the slide, so we're on slide 10 now, this is more meaningful uh, to the property risk insurance community when represented as annual exceedance probabilities. And what this shows is a depiction of the uh, increase, just about logarithmic increase, of the annual exceedance probability over time. And you can see this really skyrockets in the second half of the century uh, based on the sea level change scenario used here. In this case, I'm just using U.S. Army Corps High, um, which is uh, a conservative but realistic scenario. Uh, so true to the name, uh, we have, as this is looking at risk based on the 1% um, annual exceedance probability flood area or the special flood hazard area, the risk in 2020 is approximately 1% of failure. Uh, if you're designing once again to the base flood elevation. Uh, this rises all the way up to just about 15 or more than 15% uh, annual risk of failure by the time you get to the end of the century, clearly unacceptable. Uh, and if you've advanced the slide again, so you should see that uh, the bar chart migrate downward. Uh, so this is designed to building code and you can see that building code approximately halves the risk in the current year in 2020. Um, and very significantly buys it down in out years, we still end up with a more than 5% risk uh, by the time we reach the expected um, end of the useful life of this asset. And then designing to the Port Authority standard, once again, code plus three feet of sea level rise, you see this buys down risk very significantly. In the current year, this is approximately a tenth of a percent and um, absolutely by, the de by design, by the time we get out to uh, 2100, the out year of this asset's expected useful life, we're right, about, right back uh, at about 1% uh, annual exceedance probability. Um, so if you advance the slide, you should see some yellow bars go across. The, what, what, what I'm trying to represent here and uh, what I conveyed to our property risk insurance underwriters is that we at the Port Authority are looking at 80 years of asset risk when we design and deliver our facilities. And if you advance it one more, uh, you should see just the current year highlighted in yellow. Property risk policies are written typically for one year. It's very rare uh, that a property risk policy term is greater than a year. Sometimes you'll see an offering for 18 months or three years but the typical policy is one year of time, 12 months. Uh, 
So what we're representing to them, if you uh, would advance the slide one more, uh, so we should see a zoom in there on year one, we should see about one and a quarter percent uh, in a little red box, sort of in the upper left-hand corner. Um, this is once again designed just to the uh, base flood elevation would yield approximately 1% uh, annual exceedance probability, a 1% chance of failure during the 12 month period of the policy. This is not necessarily synonymous with a payout event, of course, because payout, we have to prove damages in quite not to get too much into the way insurance products are structured, but as we self insure to a certain degree, it would be damage over a certain very significant amount, a uh, seven figure amount. Um, so the representation here to the underwriters is you already start with a fairly infinitesimally small um, probability of payout uh, for this specific asset. This is not a representation of all of our facilities. Uh, but if you advance the slide again, uh, even under building codes, that brings you down to approximately a half a percent uh, annual exceedance probability or less than a half a percent chance of payout. And if you advance one more, this is this leaves us with, uh, this is once again under the Port Authority's guidelines, adding three feet of uh, additional effectively buffer or safety factor to code. This leaves us with about a, a tenth of a percent chance of payout uh, during that 12 month period of time, which uh, I would have to think would be received very favorably uh, by a uh, property risk insurer putting up significant capital to protect our assets. Uh, if you'll advance to slide 11. So this is, uh, I've showed you the probabilities. I thought it would hit home a little bit more if we actually put it into a simple model in which we, based on those probabilities, randomly modeled failure events. Uh, so what I've done here is conducted uh, 1,000 runs, really 1,000 hypothetical futures over the full 80-year expected uh, lifespan of this asset. Um, and very significant for the underwriters, you can see the sort of summary statistics up there on the right-hand side, 2020 failures, um, once again, designing just to base flood elevation would be about 15 out of 1,000. So they'd have 15 let's say potential payout events, once again, not fully synonymous with payout, but 15 potential payout events uh, in 1,000 different potential futures. By the time we get to 2100, and this of course is much more material to the Port Authority than to insurers, uh, we have about 160 events just in that one year um, or 16% uh, chance of failure. Uh, looking over the full 80 year span, um, we have only 15, year, 15 scenarios out of 1,000, or 1 1.5% of the total runs, that have zero failures. So, and many of these runs, I should say, had three, four, or more failures over the 80-year period of time. The year of first failure on average is 2052. The median year of first failure is 2053. Uh, and if you'd advance, uh, so this is building code. So, um, as I represented earlier, building code, in fact, buys down quite a bit of risk, and it ref it's reflected in the model here. Um, 2020 failures goes down to five out of 1,000. So of the 1,000 potential futures, there would be a potential payout event for our insurers and only five of those. Um, for the agency's interest, by the time we get to 2100, we're talking about 61 failures out of 1,000, or approximately a 6.1% chance of failure. Pretty significant, pretty uh, consistent with the probabilities that I represented earlier. Although, obviously, as it's a model uh, uh, and it's randomized, the chips fall where they may. Uh, zero failure events. This is where we see the real progress. Um, in 80 years, um, we have 246 out of 1,000 model runs where we have no exceedance events, where we have no potential payouts. The year of first failure on average is 2065, and the year of first failure, the median year of first failure is 2068. And then uh, if you would advance one more, so this uh, is designed under the Port Authority's guidelines. Um, 2020 failures drops to two per 1,000. This is actually, this exceeds the probabilities, but once again, that's randomized modeling for you. 
So the point here for our insurance underwriters is based on this, you know, randomized run of a thousand potential futures, in only two of them would you actually have a potential payout. So therefore, consider reflecting that in your premium. Um, by the time we get to 2100, we're back to, we have nine failures out of a thousand. Um, that's approximately 1%. And of course, it is the uh, 1% annual exceedance probability event that we are modeling against. So that's perfectly consistent. Um, very significantly, 688 zero failure scenarios out of 1,000. The year of first failure climbs to 2070, and the median year of first failure climbs to 2081. Uh, so next and final slide, this is slide 12. So this is early work. Uh, I've presented this only once before at Transportation Research Board, and so I would say it's evolving, uh, building this bridge between the physical uh, and the financial is still a work in progress. Um, but as we've done it a few years, and we seem to have, uh, let's say, a favorable uh, impression from our property risk insurance community, um, these are early lessons that I can share with you. Um, starting with the challenges, so I can end on a high note of opportunities. Of course, there's no counterfactual policy. Uh, so an insurance underwriter is not kind enough to say, your policy with resilience is X dollars. Your policy without resilience is Y dollars. Uh, they just won't do it. They, they will write the policy based on what you have in place at that given moment. So um, there is no way, much to my chagrin, for me to actually financially quantify with any degree of uh, precision my work in the engineering space. Um, unfortunate, but uh, a, a reality. Um, the other thing that I have learned and would not have had insight into uh, previously, but I've learned this um, through years of experience with my treasury uh, and chief financial officer colleagues, is that larger market forces have a very, very significant influence on property risk pricing. Um, because property risk insurance entities are national and sometimes global, uh, they are insuring everything, and, and they insure multiple hazard types. It's not just you know coastal flood, it's inland flooding, it's wildfires, it's just about anything under the sun you can think of uh, that falls under the heading of property risk. When they have significant payout events, whether that's a wildfire in California or in Australia, it shrinks the capacity in the market when they they obviously, it makes sense they need sufficient reserves to pay out um, when they have a payout event. Um, and when they do so, they lose some of their capacity. Once they have less capacity, that capacity generally gets priced um, more dearly. So it becomes more expensive. So even if you as an ent entity, even one as large as the Port Authority, do everything right and are able to represent that you have much better protected your assets your premiums may still go up. Um, and the other item is that only a handful of insurers in the property risk market actually explicitly factor what I'm calling site-specific risk mitigation measures into the way they price their policies. Uh, many of the large insurers are still stuck in a very actuarial mode. In other words, you are in or out of a flood zone. Uh, here's your rate. There is a growing segment of the market, uh, mostly middle-sized insurers, although it's latched on with some of the larger insurance entities as well, where they are actually adopting a more engineering-based approach to developing premiums, which is very encouraging for us because uh, that's where our work really gets taken seriously. Um, that being said, insurers do appear to take this information seriously when formulating bids. Uh, it was sort of astounding to me at first, but it turns out that giving insurers a warm, fuzzy feeling uh, is important. And letting them know that uh, we are attending to these challenges, we are doing our best to um, mitigate our risk profile using you know, physical risk mitigation measures, it means something to them, even if it's difficult to quantify. Uh, the other thing is that in high-risk environments, uh, and I would say ours is a high-risk environment uh, as an area that is uh, coastal and susceptible to coastal storms. Uh, demonstrating that you are mitigating through physical strategies may actually be essential to obtaining coverage, what they call placing coverage at your desired limit. 
Um, many of you probably have some understanding of the catastrophe bonds that MTA had to place uh, several years ago. This is because they had a gap in the coverage that they were able to obtain through the traditional property risk insurance markets. Um, and then, of course, here's another silver lining. This information also supports intelligent decision making within the organization. So uh, it's not just useful to property risk insurers. It's useful agency-wide, whether it's engineering, project management, um, the line department management, or the chief financial officer's uh, duties. It, it's useful and is being incorporated actively in the way we structure our projects and our capital plan. I see I've only got about five minutes left here, but uh, that concludes my presentation. Thanks for putting up with me for 50 minutes or so, uh, and I will be very grateful to have your questions.